The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar on raising the bar and keeping it there. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us for this presentation. This presentation is also being recorded and will be posted on the Business Winning Institute page on the Shipley website. So if you have any questions during the webinar, you can submit them in the questions tab on your control panel and we will get to as many as we can. I am Mallory Price working in the background and I am happy to be here with you. Joining me as a panel of experts, Brad Douglas will monitor the webinar. He is the Executive Vice President of Global Strategy at Shipley. Paul Dayton is Managing Director of the Business Winning Institute, an organizational improvement practice area at Shipley. Dennis Berg is a senior consultant with Shipley, providing process improvement solutions and training in Shipley best practices. So thank you to the three of you for being here as our experts today. And for all of you in attendance, after this webinar, we will send you a link to a case study of a customer who embraced BDCMM to help his organization expand its business winning ability and success. So please watch out for that. So here today, our objective is to help you gain insight into a proven BDCMM model for uh, assessing and improving your business development organization um, and doing that against the industry standard. So here is our agenda for today. We'll go over an overview of the BD life cycle and how BDCMM supports that business development life cycle. Then we'll get to your questions and then we will have a Q&A and discussion at the end. So with that, Brad, I will pass the mic to you. Thank you, Mallory, and, and thanks everyone for joining uh, today and taking some time out. Um, so, and we appreciate some of the questions that came in um, upon registering for the webinar. It uh, really helped us shape the direction of the discussion that we take this and, and uh, grounded us a little bit. So with that, let's just dive right in. Um, and again, please, if you have questions as we go, type those in. Mallory has a green light to jump in and interrupt us um, as questions come in, and we'll certainly have some time, I think, at the end to, to address. But one of the first things that we wanted to do is kind of ground everyone and make sure we're all on the same page uh, as far as terminology. What is a business development framework? Um, know it or not, whether we know it or not, all of our businesses are operating in some kind of business life cycle. You know, we've, we've got to bring revenue in the front door. We've got a position for that. We've got to execute on contracts and do the work. And this life cycle just has to be ongoing and continue. So it's kind of difficult to show that in a linear fashion like this. But this is the framework. This is the basic framework that we all operate under. We may call it something different. We may not phase it out in this exact way, but we all start with segmenting our market. Where are we gonna compete? Positioning ourselves long-term, uh, assessing and qualifying opportunities, going through some kind of capture, opportunity capture phase into usually we have to compete and we have to do that through a proposal or a briefing. We develop that and then there's post submittal. So that's the baseline framework that we want everyone to kind of keep in the back of your mind as we go through this capability maturity model. Because we have established over the years an actual maturity model that falls in line with this framework. Uh, and it's, it's these best practices and understanding those best practices and the advancing the maturity of our organization that is gonna help us compete and win work. So ultimately, we've got to, at some point in our businesses, we've got to qualify to compete, whether that means getting registered or whatever it means, we've gotta be qualified to even be in the game. And what we want to do over time in this framework is we want to advance. We want to go from just maybe being an unknown, in an unknown position in a market or in specific opportunities with specific customers. We want to advance toward 
being a favored position. To do that, we've got to qualify opportunities. We've got to research opportunities and competitors. We've got to try to be involved and engage with customers, ultimately to be positioned as hopefully a favored supplier or partner. It's this maturity, this business development maturity that helps us advance uh, our organization so that we can compete better, more efficiently. We can transform if we need to into an organization that is efficient. So this is the business development life cycle. These are some key elements of that. As we advance these opportunities, as we go through moving toward a favored position, as leaders in our organizations, we should be paying attention to key decision gates along the way. Should we really spend money on developing campaigns for certain opportunities? These have to align with our strategic goals. Is there enough interest uh, in specific opportunities to continue to pursue a pursuit decision? Someone has to put a stake in the ground at some point and say, we're going to compete for this work. We're qualified, we're the best solution possible, we're gonna do it. The next decision gate, someone's gotta make a preliminary bid decision. All right, are we gonna invest resources in going after this work? We validate that once a solicitation comes out or an announcement comes out from a customer that they have a need, and then ultimately we prepare our solution, our, our proposal, and we submit. So these key decision gates along that framework, that business development framework, are a key part of maturing our organization, advancing our maturity level to where we really are competing in the best way possible. The other thing the business development capability maturity model does, it helps us focus on the right business. There are too many organizations that are just competing for the sake of competing. They're, they're trying to bid on everything uh, just to get their name out there or their solution out there. So what we've done here is visually kind of tip that, those decision gates on its side into a funnel. And what BDCMM, the Business Development Capability Maturity Model helps us do is refine this funnel so that we are competing for the right work at the right time. Uh, it also will help us, as you'll see, as we go through this model uh, for, for this short period of time, you're going to see how the model can help us assess risk and the costs associated with competing because we've got to drill down and we've got to really see, make sure we're competing for the right business. So you can see the risks go up as we start to try to maybe enter new markets or we're entering existing markets with new products. You can see the risk can start low if we're into new markets with existing products and it can get quite high. The risk and the marketing costs when we're trying to introduce new products or services into new markets. So again, we've got, as leaders of organizations, we have to be able to assess the risk and return. And the maturity model helps us do just that. So in a nutshell, business winning, the framework, if we were to distill it down to just a few small steps, or, or, or tasks, it would be this. We've got to be in a position organizationally as far as winning business to analyze our competitors, analyze the customer needs, capture, uh, develop a capture plan and a strategy, put those into action plans, and then execute on it. So we just wanted to ground everyone in this framework because it's this framework that the maturity model really functions within. It's helping us get more efficient, more effective, way more competitive in how we compete for work. Uh, Mallory, I'm gonna pause there. Are there any questions yet that anyone has submitted that we should possibly address? We don't have any yet. Okay. All right, good. Well, let's go forward. Some of the questions that, uh, that you all have come up with that we and that we regularly get uh, from uh, clients, from from uh, industry experts, 
we're going to go through a few of these, and I'm going to ask Paul and Dennis if they would chime in and address some of these questions uh, from their perspective. Uh, you'll see here in a minute that this business development capability maturity model has been around for a while. This this is it's not something brand new. It, it's maybe the best kept secret out there when it comes to business development, but it is not something new. So one of the questions we got was how does the BDCMM fit within the overall business development framework? And we've kind of went through that, but Paul, would you do you have anything to add to what we walked through already? Yeah, sure. And thanks, Brad. Um, so quite simply, the BDCMM is used to understand how well or otherwise an organization has adopted, implemented, and sustained, importantly, an effective BD life cycle. It provides a yardstick, a way of finding out what is working well and what are likely to be the priority improvement areas across all the factors that can impact BD performance. It starts in phase zero, as Brad has outlined, with the organizational business strategy and goes all the way to contract award and program mobilization. Uh, the stoplight in the graphic there hints at how the results are presented, which I'll come back to later in the presentation, Brad. So Paul, just so the BDCMM, as we go through this concept, it will help us also identify some of those gaps that we might have, is that accurate? Exactly, so areas where an organization would wanna consider investing to close the gap, but equally areas where um, there is existing strength, we can recognize that so the leadership can consolidate those strengths. Okay, all right, good. Thank you, so here's here's a few questions actually uh, rolled into one, one screenshot here. Um, a little bit of background for everyone. Uh, where did BDCMM come from? Uh, does it align with, or is it similar to other capability maturity models that you may have heard of? Uh, what does it <laughs> what does it look like? You know what what exactly is it? So I think a lot of us in this webinar are familiar with CMM and CMMI. Uh, we probably, if you're in the uh, U.S. federal government market, you've probably heard of the cyber uh, CMM, uh, cybersecurity CMM that is really gaining a ton of traction now. So um, let's talk about these. And I'm going to ask Paul if you would please address these three questions one at a time. Certainly, and very good questions there as well. Um, so as some of you, some of you may already know, the first Capability and Maturity Model, or CMM, was created for software development around 35 years ago now, so it's not a new structure. It was developed at that time so the DOD could assess the suitability of potential software suppliers, software contractors into DOD programs. So that was the origin. Since then, multiple CMMs have been developed using the same structure, including, as Brad has mentioned, CMMI, which is CMM integration, and many of you in delivery programs will be familiar with that as a requirement for some government work. Um, and most recently, again, as Brad has mentioned, the cybersecurity maturity model CMMC, which again, as Brad said, is becoming a real hot topic. The BD or business winning CMM was first released in 2004, it's not new. Um, and the most recent version 2.1 was released just a couple of months ago. And the new version maps to both CMMI and to Agile methodologies. And taking the next question, Brad, what does it look like? A very reasonable question. Well, let me just build a picture here. Well, we have five maturity levels. Any of you familiar with the CMM structure will recognize that. Those are the horizontals, one being the lowest maturity level and five being the highest, going from initial, or chaos as we tend to call it, through to optimizing. We then have the verticals, five capability categories. Uh, these are customer, leadership, people, process management, and support. And each of these has a single theme, and these themes provide the focal point, if you will, or the purpose of each of the vertical categories. Within the model then, 
uh, we see 16 best practice clusters, as we call them process areas, CMMI calls them practice areas, each of which is aligned with one capability category and one maturity level. For example, relationship management on your screen there is a level four process area within the customer category. So staying with the customer category, let's now see how an organization progresses along this theme. So as we increase maturity level, our ability to engage with the customer improves and becomes more effective. Once we've dragged ourselves out of the chaos of level one, at level two, we start to be able to simply react effectively to customer requests and customer requirements as we approach level two. That's a good place to be. That's reactive, on time, compliant responses, but doing that in a reactive mode. As we move to level three, we get better at engaging early with the customer and helping the customer to define their requirements. Uh, we become proactive. And uh, to map back to um, what Brad <coughs> mentioned earlier, that's where you're shaping requirements with the customer. Uh, and then as we progress even further, when we invest further in customer relationships uh, and we get to the point where we're seeing as trusted advisors, um, and at this stage, at this level, where they can, where they're permitted under uh, under federal rules, customers may even engage with us on a sole source, non-competitive basis, which is clearly a really good place to be. So that maturity movement from chaos, reactive, proactive, through to being uh, in a really good place with the customer, Brad. Excellent. Oh, thank you, uh, Paul. Just just for uh, my clarity's sake, I'm going to back up here. So, so Paul, the model itself, because there was a specific question. You know, what does it look like? Uh, what you're saying is within each of these areas, under each capability category, and at each level, there's a there's a cluster or a whole series of assessment, uh, uh, competencies, things that we can organizationally look at to see if we wanted to, uh, where the gaps are. Is, is that what you're saying this model is built around? Exactly, Brad, it's a yardstick. So any organization could use this model um, and determine if there were gaps, where they were, how critical they were, in terms of providing a capability that would allow them to sustainably win business, Brad. Okay, great. Okay, thank you for that. All right, let's go to the next uh, uh, question. Um, how do higher and lower business development maturity organizations compare? That's a fair question. And since this has been around since 2004, I think we have some fair comparisons that we can draw. Uh, Dennis, I'm gonna add, call on you to address this question and talk to us about what these different levels within that maturity model actually mean and, and uh, how they can, how, what, you know, how, how do we interpret being at level one versus being at level four, for example? Yeah, thank you, Brad and Paul and everyone else. Glad to join you today. <clears throat> so as we examine an, uh, an organization and it's BD, but also beyond the immediate BD organization, we, we, we observe patterns of practices, some good, some not so good. So at level one, there's very little that's routinized, has a rhythm, a, a lot of ad hoc and chaotic work in identifying opportunities, uh, maybe not much capture proposals and other efforts rely on heroes. It's, it's driven by individual efforts rather than uh, good systems, databases, tools, um, et cetera. Um, and I'm, I'm guessing, I'm, I'm guessing, Dennis, we've all been there, right? Uh, yes, and uh, <laughs> ideally, they're very long. Either the organization matures or uh, we, we choose a better environment. Um, burnout's a good word, 
that, that we see uh, playing out in that situation. So the next level up, there's, there's less chaos. There's certainly more of a, of a management structure, we call that managed, but it's in a context that's not the better practices, but they are good practices for managing uh, an operation from a reactive responsive perspective. So we're able to identify and respond to customer requests, might be requests for information, requests for proposals or quotes or tenders. We're able to manage the proposal process. We're able to create um, using the processes and tools and talents of our people, uh, compliant proposals. And the proposals might be on balance, I'll say good, not excellent, not compelling, but good. Because at this level, this managed level, uh, we're not at the same level of connectedness in the customer column and the other categories uh, to get to a higher level. So level three defined, which is often a target for organizations, whether the organization's a whole company or a major division of a bigger company, it's, you know, here's where they want to get to. So more proactivity in engaging customers, knowing about opportunities in advance, being able to influence those opportunities, and having a process for the end-to-end -end BD that covers the breadth of the business, but is defined in a way that's tailorable to different situations. What that, might those situations be? Different markets different scale of opportunity, hundreds of thousands to tens or hundreds of millions of dollars, different types of work, different dynamics, different engagement of teaming partners. So that's the, the goal of defined. And again, that's a good endpoint. We'll talk more about the outcomes you might see at each of these. To go a step up from that, we now are co collecting more information and measuring how the process is operating and we're measuring it in more dimensions than we would at lower levels. So we're not just measuring win rates and capture ratios, but we might be drilling that down to individual customers, to individual groups within our company. We might be measuring the extent to which we're using certain tools. Um, and we're making decisions looking at our history and looking across different functions of our business in our bid, no bid decisions. So that might include legal, delivery, engineering, et cetera. Um, call that quantitatively managed. At the highest level, we're continuously innovating and transforming how we do what we do across all of these capability categories. We call that optimizing. And in some regard, we're in a consistent state of change reacting to adjustments in customer behavior and also in competitor behavior so that we're not thinking, ah, we've arrived and we now have the ultimate. We're keeping our eyes and ears and our metrics open to really how well we're doing. Um, now, we'll see some trends in behaviors and patterns as we move up the chain from managed to defined to quantitatively managed, et cetera, as we raise the bar, right? So what might we be seeing here as some of the impacts and what we've noticed over the decades is there are some expected and desirable and targeted impacts. Our win rates go up, sometimes dramatically so, more than double. The size of the average contract one goes up because we're being more proactive and, and can compete better on larger, higher revenue opportunities. And our cost per sales as a ratio to the level of business we're generating goes down. So we may not be reducing BD budgets, but we're certainly getting a lot more return on our spend uh, to, to go to market, uh, including in our core markets and the ones that uh, Brett identified earlier as potentially being higher risk. All right, now we also see some additional benefits um, beyond the core. Business risk goes down because at a higher level, starting with defined, we've got a more focused look at What's the uh, outcome? What might the effects be of bidding a certain program a certain way? Uh, and we might decide not to bid certain programs. We'll have stronger handovers to a delivery team when we have one, because at higher levels, the delivery team 
is very much involved in the customer engagement and planning the response. So the handover becomes much more natural and not a cold cutover. Um, customers are more satisfied because the bids we submit are ones that we are quite confident in how we're going to execute them. We've had a stronger uh, focus on risk and we've engaged with the customer consistently throughout the BD process. So when they see our, our bid or our proposal, um, they're, they're not surprised. And what we deliver is very close to what they were expecting. And last, in, in some sense, it's sort of a uh, self-fulfilling cycle is we become a more winning organization become a more pleasant organization to work with, with repeatable processes, evolution, innovation, and to get the strongest BD individuals, whether they're capture managers, proposal managers, and other specialty skills, we will have created the kind of environment that uh, all professionals in BD would, would aspire and desire to work in. It's not as chaotic. And you know, one would say there's a much better balance uh, between focus on job and BD and other personal interests, and at the same time, being more highly effective and efficient in doing what you do as a BD professional, no matter what your job is within the overall life cycle. Dennis, right? just uh, thank you for the just a couple of uh, my thoughts, and I'd be interested in yours as well as you went through some of these, you know, these reasons why we would want to advance in maturity as an organization. Um, this last bullet here, this one, attract and retain business winning. There is such a fight right now. There is such a fight for good talent um, going on in the business development community. And, you know, finding those, those good uh, business development people that can establish relationships and manage a team and, lead and organ it's it's tough you know it's a fight for talent so i i think what you're saying here on this last bullet is that if we can boast i'm, I'm using kind of a if we can boast that our bd organization is at a level three or four that may help us attract and certainly if we're operating like a level three or four certainly retain our people is that kind of what you're saying there that there could be a, an advantage to hiring very much an advantage and indeed sometimes the way it works is word gets around that your company is now winning more and word gets around that the people who are working there are having a more positive experience uh, in that winning so to some extent it you know we could put forth or boast about you know what level we're at um, but but the results in uh, sort of professionals talk to each other um, you know, as I worked for an organization that went on this journey, um, we, we hired a fair number of very top talent that we could not have hired uh, previously, and including uh, a number of folks at the director level, not just frontline, you know, capture managers, proposal managers, because um, there was a recognition that something had changed over at that company, and it was doing better, and it was worth checking out. Interesting. So, good question. The other, uh... The other thought I had, Dennis, and this doesn't really weren't discussion, but as you went through this was the idea that the more mature my organization is as a leader and I have things, uh, my, my procedures, my processes documented with the appropriate gates and decision gates and things, it will help me as a leader hold people accountable where absent that, absent that discipline and that documentation, sometimes it's hard, you know, it's hard as a leader to hold people accountable when everything's fuzzy, you know, exactly. and roles, responsibilities, and tasks are a little bit fuzzy. So thank you for that. Um, would you walk us through this next chart um, is a notional idea of, of what this could mean for an organization as we advance through the levels? Absolutely, Brad, glad to do that. So what we observe um, over uh, now, uh, over uh, a couple of decades is that um, level one organizations tend to have low win rates, percent of proposals that are awarded. 
and also have very relatively low what we call capture ratio, which is looking at the dollars behind those bids. So it's the ratio of dollars one to the total dollars that could have been won in the combination of opportunities. As we move up to level two, up to the more reactive and the managed approach, um, we begin to have a process or multiple processes and we see a big jump. You know, that 35%, right, as you know, is a top number, but we could be jumping to 51 to 65% on both win rates and capture ratios. And I'll say that in some of the weaker organizations, we see capture ratios that are significantly lower than the win rates because the organizations are good at winning or better at winning very small opportunities than the larger, more competitive ones. As we get to level three, the win rate uh, is pretty much in the same bracket, but we're now even more effective in the larger opportunities. And those really tilt the equation and tilt the numbers and why that's such a target. You know, if we look at winning 66 to 80% of the dollars of the opportunities we decide to bid, and oh, by the way, we're writing fewer proposals at level two compared to level one, and fewer still at level three compared to level two, because we're better managing and better targeting and planning our resources to use a phrase, get more bang for the buck. We're not spreading our BD resources thing. We're using them to best advantage. And as we move up to levels four and five, we see yet another improvement in the win rate and the capture ratio is already quite high. Now in our observations, there are parts of level four and five accomplished by some organization, uh, it, organizations. It's rare that we'd see and across the board in all capability categories of four and five. But for those organizations or divisions of organizations that have achieved level three, um, we've shifted the paradigm of business challenge from how to win enough business to preserve our size, our revenue, our profitability, and ideally grow. We've shifted from how do we meet our goals that way to how do we staff the work we're winning and needing to become more selective in what we bid because we do have the potential to grow at a very rapid rate. And there's a need to then balance the rate of growth driven by business winning against the ability to grow the staffing and facilities and the infrastructure to keep delivering at the level of quality we want to sustain with our customers. So uh, Brad, thank you for that question. Thank you, Dennis. Um... And Mallory, I see we've got a few questions. Maybe this is a good place to pause and address a couple of those. Uh, Mallory, would you uh, would you read a couple of those off, and then we'll designate someone to answer those? Sure. Um, I think we've already discussed a little bit, um, but under the leadership category, can you explain vision and performance? Is it strategic vision or is it BD specific vision? Hmm. Good question. So under that leadership category, Paul, I'm going to ask you to maybe address this. Under that leadership category, um, uh, the vision and performance, are we talking strategic vision or are we talking specific to business development uh, vision? Yeah, it's a great question. And the answer is both. So at the lower maturity levels, we're looking for um, tactical involvement in, in higher value pursuits. So we're expecting the, the leadership team to their sponsor and be the exec sponsor for a handful of high value critical pursuits for the organization. And as we go to level four, we're also seeing uh, the BD leadership actually um, driving and being a, a voice into the overall business strategy. So rather than reacting to the business plan, they're helping to write the business plan and have that strategic vision for the organization while still occasionally supporting individual pursuits as an ex as an exec sponsor brand. Great, thank you. Thanks. Uh, the other question um, I see, how do you get um, proven business development individuals to buy into a new methodology when they feel they already know how to how to sell naturally? Um, 
so that that's a really good good question and and i you know i think part of what dennis covered just recently on that uh, last screen when sometimes we need actual data you know we we need proof points to get leadership or others to buy in um to and 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 what we're presenting here as as a capability maturity model isn't so much a methodology as it is how do i really take my organization to the next level organizationally um and uh but that's a great question you know change management convincing leadership to make a change or to transform is never easy uh it, it's never easy and there is no no silver bullet you know to doing that but hopefully as we go through the rest of this webinar there will be some some good um, points that could address that uh, comment so thank you for those okay uh, one of the uh, questions also we got uh, at, uh, as you registered why are business leaders typically interested in BDCMM and and uh, you know Paul and Dennis <laughs> it's a great question for you all because you're practitioners and you've helped organizations through this so uh, let's break this down, if you will, into why you see the, what are the key drivers for why a leader would embrace this type of scrutiny, you know, going through this assessment with a, a plan to improve. Paul, would you cut, go ahead first? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take uh, the first couple of items. And yeah, looking back and preparing for this webinar, just thinking about what were those leadership motivators and the first one uh, was around um, the competition is getting stronger. Okay, so the next one um, was certainly around uh, a leader leading a an independent view of where they really were. Um, we'll dig a bit more into detail in a moment. Now, the third one, um, pre or post merger or acquisition, typically um, uh, more commonly looking to repair the damage after a poorly executed merger or acquisition and finally the fourth reason that kept floating to the top there was um, leaders just trying to understand why they've lost four or five in a row um, maybe we can zoom in on a couple of these uh, initial um, scenarios brad so um, certainly um, in some organizations maybe it's been easy for a while complacency sort of sets in uh, maybe the customer has changed personnel, wants to mix things up a little. Um, putting these two factors together particularly can often encourage the competition to become more ambitious and more aggressive. And this aggression and ambition needs to be countered. So that, that's the first, the first reason that people or leaders typically um, have turned to the model, Brad. Uh, the second one that, that came to the, the top was um, it's often triggered by a change of executive leadership. Um, a desire to understand the current position as a basis for change and improvement um, and for that baseline to come from an independent source. So they'll talk to lots and lots of people. People come and talk to them. Um, but what's really happening? Um, how can we get an independent view on this to develop a the baseline of where we are uh, as a basis for improvement. Um, this also may, may be driven by um, shareholders. We see that quite a bit, and also from key internal stakeholders uh, having influence on on a, a new exec leader looking after business winning business development. And above all, I would say what we see is leaders wanting to take a positive step. So they've just joined an organization they want to take a positive step, not just to keep reacting to events, a desire to lead, not simply to manage. Great. Thanks, Paul. And then the, the other couple that you mentioned, uh, Dennis, would you address these, these other couple of reasons why we see um, leaders engaging this, this approach? Sure, Brad, glad to. Um, now, if we think of mergers and acquisitions, right, there's pre and post merger. And you know, historically, 
we don't see a lot of diagnosis of the BD function as part of the due diligence when a uh, company is being acquired, but the BDCM certainly could do that and provide some insights as to the level of capability and effectiveness and efficiencies um, before an opportunity is uh, consummated on the merger side. Um, once an organization is acquired, um, looking at the combined organization, there may be opportunities from the acquiring organization, the acquired organization, to share best practices, to, to grow together, to get the leverage that was sought in delivery, um, in customer support, in other functions, and bring that into, into BD as well. So the framework gives us a good idea as to what to, what to look at across those five categories. What we tend to see as a trend is when an organization is acquired, that the combination of the two tends to drift down from the stronger partner and be the, the weaker of the two. And indeed, we've, we've seen organizations that go through a series of, uh, of acquisitions of other companies and um, actually lose capability and become more chaotic and become more disjoint uh, due to challenges of integrating uh, business operations, including integrating BD operations. Um, across you know acquired companies and the parent company, so to try to you know find our way as uh, that kind of company out of the integration trend challenge box, um, we can use the BDCMM to guide what it is we look at uh, to see where to operate first. Um, now we also might have been moving along quite well uh, and winning our fair share of business. And then noticed over could be weeks, months, that we have a series of large must-win type opportunities. And we have a nagging feeling that when we get the debriefs from the customer, that there may be something systemic going on. It's not just that, well, one was based on price and one was based on technical approach. Indeed, we may have looked back and seen some patterns internally that they were they were fire drills. They sounded like a level one type type opportunity. Um, just doesn't seem like bad luck. We just you know have a sense about that, and we need to take a deeper look to understand what are excuse me what are the dynamics. What is it about how we interact with customers, our processes, our people, our practices? So the BDCMM raises uh, a set of questions, focal points in those five areas, which tend to surface gaps or diminishment of capability. Maybe we've had some turnover and we had more people-based processes than institutionalized processes. The BDCMM can, can help us see under the covers and then point us into and help us decide the highest priority places that would help us reverse reverse that string of losses and turn it around and and actually turn it around pretty quickly. Um, so, Brad, thank you for that opportunity. Back to you. Yeah, th thanks for covering um, <clears throat> those four reasons uh, to both of you. And this this kind of gets to the comment that was in the question box earlier. You know, how do you convince people or, or seasoned leaders or managers that that something's wrong. <laughs> well, this particular slide, there's nothing that will convince management that there's a problem more than uh, losing two or three or four in a row that they think they should have won. And by then it's too late. You know, by then we've embraced uh, old technologies or old ways of doing it. We've, we've counted on sole source contracts or uh, longstanding, um, relationships and now they're gone and we start losing and we wonder why and so the whole concept i think of getting ahead and, and being a mature business development organization is staying ahead of those losses uh, so that we don't get into that that rut uh, i think paul used the word uh, early on that we get complacent you know, and thinking we've we've got it, we've got it now. We're doing great, so let's just keep on moving. So thanks for covering 
uh, those reasons. Um, the next question um, we can cover really quickly, I think, what types of companies and industries have applied the BDCMM and their organizations? And Paul, you've had the most global um, perspective on this. So you just want to address this one? Certainly, Brad. And um, as you said earlier, it's been around a long time now. So over the last 17 years, the BDCMM has been adopted across the world pretty much and in many different sectors. So we've worked in from defense to healthcare, from IT to transportation, from uh, professional services to outsourcing, from aerospace to telecom. So pretty much um, most sectors that you, you could possibly think of uh, and some besides. And also worth making the point that uh, these are not all global corporations. Some of these are small and medium enterprises. So given the structure of the model, You've seen how modular it is. It's eminently um, scalable. So these are not all large um, corporations. Some are SMEs. Um, and each of the organizations represented on this slide here uh, had one or more of the motivating scenarios that Dennis and I covered a few moments ago, Brad. Good. Th thanks for clarifying that, Paul, because you, you could draw the conclusion, oh, this is only for big, massive global companies. And uh, you've just clarified that, no, that, that's not always the case, that this is scalable uh, and can be adopted um, by some of the, the smaller to mid-sized. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so I think what what I've heard and what we understand is at the heart of adopting this business development maturity idea is the willingness, uh, kind of the courage, if you will, to to look internally. You know, how are we doing? Where are we lacking? Where are we strong? Uh, what competencies, capabilities do we have and, and where are we falling short? So at the heart of this is really that appraisal, that willingness to take a real, honest, truthful, unbiased snapshot of where we are. And so the, the question, this is a good question that came in and I'm glad it was asked because the question is how are BDCMM appraisals, this, this assessment, this appraisal, how are results uh, presented and fed back? Um, so uh, Paul, would you, I know we can't, we don't have time obviously to go into this at all in depth, but we showed this model before. Can you give us an idea of just how you present your findings and recommendations back after you do this appraisal and this assessment? Certainly, Brad. Um, and the first thing to say is that BDCMM is for a leadership audience. So the way we present this back has got to be for a leadership, um, from a leadership view and would be appreciated and understood by your leadership team. So our job is to take all the complexity that's underneath the hood of the BDCMM and of business development and make it uh, manageable um, and make it improvable. And we do this through a simple stoplight reporting scheme using a red, amber, green scheme. And what we're doing is taking all that complexity that we found and really distilling this into um, areas where the senior team may wish to consolidate. Uh, everything's looking good, keep it running. Areas where um, there's a few issues, but nothing dramatically wrong a little bit of uh, extra management attention, leadership attention required. And those out and out red areas where, you know, here's a red flag, here's something that you really need to get um, a look at um, and helping that leadership team to prioritize their investments. But sometimes an organization can just spray investments all over the place, just hoping that one of them lands and it makes a change, makes a difference. What we give is that sort of very clear, crystal clear view on where to put the effort and that could be dollars it could just be time or it could well be both and just to uh, conclude by saying this approach can be taken for a single operating unit it can be taken across the whole enterprise covering multiple OUs and indeed multiple geographies and some of the examples we uh, touched upon a few moments ago um, were covering multiple geographies from a single organization and the overall reason behind this what the leadership team are trying to do and we held them is to raise the bar and keep it there, Brad. 
Great. And the goal, obviously, I assume, Paul, is not to go from uh, uh, level one to four <laughs> overnight. I mean, it, it's it's got to be uh, scaled and phased in, I would assume. Yes, and it takes a little time, but not as long as you might think. And um, we have some examples of organizations who have gone from a, um, a mid sort of ranking two to a three inside, you know, six, 12 months. Um, the clear discriminator that makes those organizations succeed is leadership. If leadership are behind this, um, then this can happen relatively quickly. If leadership isn't behind it, then don't do it, basically. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, well, thank you. Um, as we wind down here, um, this is just, this is a screenshot of, a, of again, this is just a sampling. I've, I've taken a screenshot here of one of the tools that is used to do this assessment, to analyze the, the data, the feedback, and turn it into an action plan. Um, so there, there is a complete comprehensive toolkit behind this. Um, uh, it's, it's more than just, you know, something at the discussion level. Um, so here you can see a cutout, you know, of the various levels and, and what kind of score might come out of this deep dive into each one of those, uh, those categories, if you will. And you see some of these tabs, there's a whole assessment approach uh, with this color coding of scoring. And again, analyzing, ultimately diving down into an, something that's actionable, an action plan that leadership and management can actually take forward and execute on. Uh, it's nice to know where we are. It's nice to know where we're strong or where we've got gaps, but how much nicer is it to have an action plan, something actionable where we can actually take, uh, take tasks and hold people accountable uh, for that. So uh, again, it's this deep dive assessment really that, that guides the targeted sustainable improvements in our organizations. Uh, Paul mentioned this earlier, of course, we wanna focus in on our strengths first make sure we know where we're strong and we leverage those strengths. And then we wanna be guided in our attempts to become more mature, more efficient, more effective. What, what areas can we improve in? Which areas will have the greatest impact the quickest? Agree on those action plans. Where do we start? How do we make those measurable? And the caution here is don't bite off too much all at once. You know, we've got to, uh, attack the low-hanging fruit first to make this effective. Okay, um, with that, uh, there is a final question we had. Are, the, are we able to share results from a real BDCNM client? What we're gonna do, and Mallory mentioned this, we'll send you out, those of you that participated today, uh, we'll send you out a little thank you note and then we'll send you a link a link to a case study of a, a customer that uh, Paul and I talked to that was willing to share how they went about applying BDCM in, in their organization and some of the results that they've come up with. But let me just pause. Um, Mallory, are there some any other questions that were submitted that we could possibly address? So I think the other question that we had, we answered. It was about how long does it take to implement this level and get to, or be, implement a BDCMM and get to levels four and five. And, and Paul did talk about that a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, again, thank you all. Um, this is the case study. If, if you click into that link, we'll send you. Uh, this is the case study uh, from Alstom and some of the results that they experienced. Uh, you can see that they were significant. They were able to add new jobs because they in increased their efficiency. They won more more work and more business. So we'll we'll get you a link to that, and you can listen to him firsthand uh, talk about the approach they took. So again, thank you so much. Uh, just 
we, we've talked about trying to align our, our BD life cycle with the BDCMM and how this maturity model supports that life cycle. The idea that we need to assess and measure our progress and we were hopefully able to answer most of your questions that you submitted before or during the webinar. So with that, I will uh, sign off for all of us here at uh, Business Winning Institute and Shipley Associates. Thank you for your time. Feel free uh, to contact us. Um, here's an email address that'll get to any of us, bwi at shipleywins.com. And thank you for your time. And uh, we hope you'll join us for future webinars. Take care, everybody.